Before we get started, I just wanted to introduce a special guest, Senator Mark Leno, who's been such a huge uh, supporter of our organization in the community for so many years in so many ways. Thank you. Yeah. So, on July 23rd of this year, just about 10 days ago, a very extraordinary occasion occurred. Our own little Alicia Flames Elizondo reached her three score tenth birthday. <laughs> <laughs> that, of course, being the biblically prescribed length of life. So, Felicia, every day is icing up the cake. <laughs> um, and we expect you to be here for many score more. I, that, well, I know. And so, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize a stellar citizen of San Francisco. Felicia is a self described Mexican Spitfire, screaming queen. Pioneer, legend, icon, diva, 29 years survivor of AIDS, and Vietnam veteran. Yeah. And of course, has shown us the way to live our lives out loud with full pride and confidence, with a heart as wide open and as large as the Golden Gate. So we are so very appreciative, Felicia. We first got to know each other. I, of course, well aware of your participation in Compton's Cafeteria back in 1966, and all you have done since. But our work together on the Transgender Implementation Civil Rights Task Force back in around 1999-2000, when I was on the Board of Supervisors, bringing that task force to bring the community leadership together to see what a top priority would be for us at the board to do legislatively. And out of all of the concerns impacting the transgender community, access to education, to health care, to employment, to housing, <coughs> safety in the streets, access to equal justice in the criminal justice system, the decision was to move forward with a bill, first of its kind in the country, to provide equal access to the city and county health plan for the county's transgender employees. And we move forward with that. Interestingly, I won't digress too much, but I like telling this story <laughs> that all the headlines screamed the city to pay for sex change operations. Mm -hmm. As much as we try to better inform them, well, maybe, but that's not what the local ordinance was about. And it was at that time that I got my first invitation to be on the Bill O'Reilly show. <laughs> and I said, so of course you don't want to do that. I didn't even know who he was at the time. Oh they told me, and I said, oh, I certainly want to do that. <laughs> so I went on a show. First question out of his mouth, supervisor. Why should my tax dollars go to for someone's sex change? Well, Bill, that's not what we're doing. Let me explain. If you're a non-transgender employee in the city and county of San Francisco, and you need hormonal treatment or psychiatric treatment, a hysterectomy or a mastectomy, the county health plan pays for it all. But if you're a transgender employee, you need the identical medical care. The plan pays for it and none of it. And when I finished, Bill O'Reilly said, Supervisor, you make a compelling argument. <laughs> and I, I share that with you all because people understand what we're talking about. Basic fairness, respect, dignity, and validation of human life. Their desire to discriminate evaporates very quickly. I was pleasantly surprised to see in a national poll recently, 70% of Americans opposing the North Carolina bathroom bill and supporting access of bathrooms according to one's chosen uh, gender identity. So pretty simple. People get it when they understand it. So Felicia, I just wanted to take a moment before you begin your presentation I, to bring you a little love from the California State Senate. It's a resolution for Felicia A. Elizondo. And of course, not only suitable for Freddie, it is Freddie. And I will uh, spare you all the witty and wonderful whereas clauses, but the resolve clause is that 
we are so proud to appropriately recognize this important occasion of your 70th birthday, thanking you for your years and life of leadership and dedication and commitment to equal treatment for all people and continue, wish you continued success in the years of your activism to come. Thank you. running down the Castro in his little, uh, running, uh, <laughs> shorts. You gotta run in something. Or in the Castro, <laughs> but I, I used to always say, oh my God, what a great looking man. And I always, I didn't know who he was for a long time. Then I knew he was this, hey, I wish I was gay. <laughs> I was driving straight. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a run for your money. <laughs> 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 okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jared. Love me from Mark Leno. I don't know what we're going to do without him in Sacramento. I think it's going to be so really good. I don't care who replaces him. Um, well, I do, but not here. Yeah. Uh, our future mayor, yes. Um, and uh, I just, again, I wanted to say, uh, Felicia, it's, it's such an honor to have you here and your entourage as well. Uh, thank you so much for my, my friends and from my neighbor. <laughs> and my and my. And I want, to welcome, I want to welcome you all. Before we begin the presentation, I just want to uh, welcome you all, and then I'm going to turn it over to Don Rumford, who's done such a wonderful job of, uh, of our curating our programming here at the museum. Uh, the Historical Society has been around for 31 years. Um, it started basically with people you know, in the middle of the AIDS epidemic in 84, the early years, when you know, we just barely knew what was causing it, and people's things were being thrown out um, into dumpsters. and. And, uh, and fortunately, uh, Lily Walker and others started collecting these things and, and, and hoarding them and, and cataloging them and, and then started collecting publications and magazines and before you knew it, they had too much stuff and they had to move to a bigger space and move again. We just moved again a couple of months ago, actually in May, to a space down in mid-market uh, neighborhood of our archives, which is really the heart and soul of, this, of our organization. Um, and so we're still collecting things. We have much more space now. Um, if you've tried to collect some uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful historical documents or artifacts from the, from ancient times, <laughs> the seventies, or the eighties, or uh, or even more recently than that, you know, because we we do want to focus our collections, we want to expand our collections, especially from people of color, from lesbians, uh, what are the other transgender uh, communities of uh, uh, early prior prior to the seventies. Uh, if, if you've tried to contribute things before and we didn't have room, come back again because now we have some room on the show. So we're very excited about that. Um, our, our big plan now is to create a new museum. Um, as you can see, we're standing room only. This happens several times a month. I would love to have a raked seating, you know, uh, with auditorium, with special effects and lights. And, you know, so, and, you know, so I, I've been on the job six months and everyone thinks I'm a little crazy. But I, I, you know, I'm, I'm with you, Felicia, Feliciano. I mean, we, 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 we got to uh, have a vision and say what's possible, and then follow that path. You know, what's right? What, what do we deserve? And our community deserves a much larger space. A gallery this size would not be sufficient to hold uh, AIDS activism, for example. But right now we have a small panel over there on AIDS activism, which is lovely. But it's not. It's, it, it doesn't really answer 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 the uh, answer the issue of what, of what we need and what our community. Because it's not just about showing our stuff. It's about educating people so that they learn from uh, the lessons that we so hard fought and learned. Um, so uh, so I, I only make this brief pitch because uh, we're beginning a campaign now, and we're looking for collaborators. We're looking for donations. If you, uh, if this is your first time at the museum, please come back. 
check us out, spend some time here, make an appointment to go down to the archives, poke around, see who you know, who you remember, make a donation there, become a part of our community because we have so many thousands of people coming here every year from all across the country and around the world. And they take the messages of our stories and they bring it home with them. And it makes it, uh, I, I believe, uh, that work and the work from the archives where documentaries and films and books are made from the materials that have been contributed there create change. It creates change for young people, young queer people in this country and for communities across the world. So it's so important and I'm so proud to be in this position uh, to help to make this work happen. So, um, so if you have a member, if you can, it's uh, $50 a year, uh, $30 low income, and uh, you know, it goes up from there. Of course, we'll take as much as you got. <laughs> Put us in your will. Anyway, so um, I'm very excited to be here, and I'm excited to hear the presentation. I want to turn it over to John just to make a few brief announcements. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, sir. I just heard I'm also advancing your slides tonight. So, uh, okay. Only oh. for you, Felicia. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, I'm uh, thrilled to be doing programming for this organization, and um, just tonight is such a wonderful thing when I look out and see so many different people here. We do have maybe seven seats over here, so don't be shy if you're those people kind of standing over there uh, to come in. Um, this is the, um, the second event in the Compton's Cafeteria Riot 50th Anniversary Commemoration. And it's a partnership that, um, that I was really happy to be able to put together with the Tenderloin Museum and with the Roxy Theater. And so we have programming that's going um, a little bit last month, this month, and next month. And you should go to our website to check out um, all the different stuff that's happening. But I do want to just highlight a couple of things that are coming up. Um, uh, one thing that I'm really excited about is um, two trans artists, um, Nikki Green and, <laughs> and Chris Vargas, are, um, are putting together um, commemorative um, art piece items for the 50th anniversary. And uh, they are this amazing mug um, that Nikki has has done where she went to thrift stores all around the Bay Area to find these old mugs and then to, um, I don't even know how, what the truth is, I'm not a ceramicist person, but glaze right on this Compton's 50th, hand glaze on this Compton's 50th thing that looks like the Compton's cafeteria logo, but then also has this other stuff in it, and to sort of commemorate uh, the coffee mugs being one of the things that were, of course, thrown in the riot. Um, so there's going to be 50 of those, and they're going to be on sale uh, for, I think, 50 bucks a piece um, uh, here and at the Tenderloin Museum. And then Chris Vargas is doing a silkscreen shirt that's also going to be a run of only, I believe, 50. Um, so uh, uh, the artist talk for that event is going to be um, on Tuesday, August 16th here. Uh, and I, I love that we are uh, both representing those who have who've made the history and then uh, taking people who are inspired by the history and seeing what they're going to do with it for the future. So, um, so that's really great. Um, another thing, uh, go to our website if you want to see the full range of things that we're doing for the conference at the, um, here at the, at the um, Tenderloin Museum uh, and the screening of Screaming Queens at, Rock, at the Roxy Theater. Um, Another thing that we have coming up that I'm thrilled about, uh, we are looking, uh, we have a, a new exhibit opening uh, on this, uh, one of our front gallery walls here on Friday, August 19th, uh, and that's uh, Through Knowledge to Justice, the, sex, the Sexual World of Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld, and it's looking at um, this true, true pioneer of sexology and of um, the idea that medicine and sexual liberation could go together in different and interesting and important ways and cross uh, oceans to do so. So uh, that show is going to be opening um, on August 19th, and I'm really excited about that. Um, we have our film series that's every month, uh, Mighty Reels, um, and um, this one at the very end of the month is maybe most appropriate to that title of anything we've done, right, which is 
uh, Happy Birthday to Sylvester. Uh, so it's, it's where um, John Raines, our film and, and uh, video archivist, goes into our archive and pulls all these little goodies and he knows all this stuff in, in this encyclopedic way and is going to pull the different things together and show stuff that, that um, you know, hasn't been seen in 30 years and more, right? So, um, so that should be really cool. Um, we have a ton of other stuff, but uh, I just encourage you to go to our website rather than me going on and on about it. I would be remiss if I didn't say that one other amazing thing that's happening with the conference cafeteria riot celebration <laughs> is um, the celebration that's going to happen at Turk and Taylor that Felicia and the committee are putting together on um, Sunday, uh, the 28th of this month. And they are also selling t-shirts and mugs. <laughs> and the it's a bouquet girl. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Starting off before we do um, right. Washington. Okay. So it's a boat at her park. Right. Okay. Good. Um, they're selling them, and um, theirs are more like uh, grinding them out to. They look fabulous. Grinding out those t-shirts and mugs out to make some real money uh, to support uh, that celebration on that day. So I really encourage you to go to FeliciaFlames.com and to buy uh, this really wonderful, uh, it's the logo that you all found on the postcards on your seat, um, these wonderful t-shirts and mugs there as well. Okay, so um, Mark did such a good job of introducing you. I think I'm just gonna leave it at that. He was able to do this sort of off the top of his head, which I thought was his job. I was like, I would have to read something. But um, uh, suffice it to say that uh, um, Felicia Elizondo is uh, a true icon of this community, um, a stalwart um, uh, fighter for this history and for this memory, and uh, without her persistence and ferocity and humor, um, we would not have the kind of awareness of Compton's and its important significance today um, uh, without you. Uh, I'm really proud of this uh, presentation that I know that you put together. You spent a lot of time on it, and uh, we got to see a preview of it um, at uh, Sonoma State University, where I teach in January. And if this is uh, anything like that, people are going to be riveted. So uh, let's go, Felicia. Let's go. Thank That, that's for the, the video. Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming. Oh my God, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> I am glad to be here at 70 years old. I, I just turned 70. And uh, as, as, as Mark Lano and Don has given me the privilege to to give this presentation like I did at Sonoma, uh, New Mexico. I mean, uh, Sonoma State University. State University. Sometimes I get my senior moments, so you have to, <laughs> you have to wait. Sometimes I go there and say, uh-oh. Oh, anyway, uh, thank you for coming. I hope this is interesting because we all need to know our history and where we came from because it's important that all of you know and understand that the seniors, all the seniors, had to go through what we had to go through. And that's why you all have this freedom that you have today. So here I'm gonna start. I, this is already done, next. I was born in San Angelo, Texas on July 23rd, 1946 at 8 a.m. to my father, Felicia, Alessandro Antur and my mother Juanita Alvarado Alessandro, a boy named Felipe Alvarado Alessandro, brother Javier, 20 years older than me, Feliz Faye, about 15 years older than me, and Mary Ellen, two years, and my after after me came my baby sister Dolores, one year younger than I. Next. Do you want me to say it or can you read? <laughs> Felipe, Philip, was a young, poor, confused, 
about whom he was and where he was going. Childhood was terrible. Kids made fun of him, me. Always wanted to be like other boys, but I wasn't. No matter how hard I tried, people were calling me names, CC, queers, Joto, before I even knew the meaning of the word. All through school, from first grade to high school, was a nightmare. In my junior year, I ran for cheerleader and I won, but the kids made it so horribly that my grades went down. And in my senior year, I could not fulfill my, my duties as a cheerleader. I was devastated, but who could I turn to? No one there to understand me or tell me who I was. The varsity team cornered me in the corner in the hallway and they made fun of me and wanted me to do things to them, but a teacher saved me. But the students always made fun and harassed me, so I quit school about six months before I graduated. Mm -hmm. San Jose, California. I was born in San Angelo, then we moved to uh, San Ysidro, then we moved back to San Angelo, then to Stockton, then to, oh, Stockton was my first it was my first gay man that I ever met. He was tall, handsome, his name was Victor Torres. And he was, we were two girls, so we couldn't do anything, so we just <laughs> bumped pussies or something like that. <laughs> but he was, he was the first one that I ever met as, a, as an other person other than me. I knew I was different, but I didn't know how different I was. So here is San Jose in the 1960s, next. There's another part of San Jose in the 19, in six, 1963. Around the clock was on Santa Clara Street between 1st and 2nd Street. The restaurant, between, uh, the restaurant that was open 24 hours as young gay boys, we couldn't go to the bars or hang around 24 seven at St. James Park. This is the only place that we could hang out and meet other friends. And this was the park where I became a, I was walking down the street. <clears throat> and you know, in my days, queens used to always put their <laughs> toes down so they know that you were a sissy. <laughs> so this guy, this guy picked me up on Santa Clara Street. I was around 15 years old. And uh, he, he paid me for my services. <laughs> And uh, he told me where the, the, the gay, well, it wasn't the gay community, it was the queer community that, that hung around at St. Jay's Park. I met all my friends there. Uh, Bernie, Frankie, Dee Dee, I mean, Bernie, Frankie, uh, and a whole bunch of kids. I could ramble them on, but I can't, I can't remember all of them, but I became a little boy hustler. Next. And the Crystal Gay Bar in the 1960s was in, in San Jose and San Fernando. All the little, <clears throat> all the little gay boys used to s stand outside at two o'clock in the morning so we could get picked up. Next. In 1960s, I met this guy and he was my sugar daddy and he brought me here to San Francisco for the first time. This is the, the skyline in the 1960s. That's the skyline in 2015. What a difference, huh? This was the Greyhound Bus Depot in San Jose where we used to uh, skip school and come down to the next one, to the bus depot on 7th and Market. And it was not very far away from the Tenderloin. Next. Katie's restaurant was was a place where uh, me and my best friend Bernie came and stood because Compton's Cafeteria was a block away, but it was too scary for us, so we wouldn't go any farther than there. Then one day we met this, 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 this queen, her name was Ciro, and she took us to her apartment. We were here before drag was legal. We were here before uh, uh, it was against the law to dress like a female. It was against the law to wear long hair. And <clears throat> he took us to the apartment. He was putting makeup on and running his hair. And we wore uh, 
and grass sweaters, skin tight pants. And then he says, and he told us he was a hair fairy. And that's how I got to be a hair fairy because a lot of the queens came from all over the world. They came from all over, uh, just, not, it wasn't word of mouth, it wasn't in the media, it wasn't in the television or the newspapers. It was word of mouth. A lot of the queens, hustlers, gay boys, queers, came to the Tenderloin to start a new life and a new identity because their families had thrown them out like trash, didn't want any queers or sissies or hotos in their family, so they either put them in the closet or just, and we, a lot of them just decided to leave and start a new life. 18 years old, you know, maybe younger, 17. This was Headhunters. It was on Embarcadero. It was on the second floor. It was an after hours place. We couldn't get in there because we were not old enough. You had to be 18. It was a coffee shop, but it was an after hours place. It was a place to really have fun, but all we could do is stare <laughs> from afar. Next. Embarcadero YMCA, where the Navy, the Marines had their ball, had a ball. It was the, there was a, a little, uh, it was well known to the, the queer community, to the sissies and everything like that, that the Embarcadero was the place to go mess around if you wanted a sailor <laughs> or a Marine or an Air Force or whatever. The talk of the town was a, a gay bar that we used to pass by going toward the Embarcadero, but when we came back, we used to sneak and open the door because we were too young. Woolworths on Market and Powell. Does anybody remember them? Oh, yeah. oh. you're my kind of girls and boys. This is where all the queens used to go there and get cheap makeup and <laughs> wigs. Uh, Anything that has to do with a sissy, it was there. <laughs> Next. Tad's Steakhouse. You guys remember, is it still there? Still there. Yeah. Well, still there. the only reason that we went to State House is because we knew there was a, a gay man that managed the place and he used to hire cute boys. <laughs> and that's why we went there to eat. Next. This one, when I came with a whole bunch of friends and we, we hustled somebody to buy us some Thunderbird wine to get drunk. <laughs> I remember Thunderbird, who remembers Thunderbird? <laughs> we, we were, I was so drunk that I was even selling my restaurant just for a dollar just to get another bottle of wine. <laughs> Next. This was the uh, Union Square uh, in the 60s. This was a, a, a place for hustlers to come in and make their money and do and, and socialize with other people. Next. The Alley Cat was a disco bar. Uh, it was on uh, Mason and Gary, somewhere around there. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, and it was a disco bar and it was fast, it was mixed. It wasn't solely for gays, it was just a mixed bar that we could, anybody could go there and dance the night away. Next. The Guilty Cage, does anyone remember the Guilty Cage? Do you remember Charles Pierce? He used to perform there. And for, uh, for a head, going ahead is I spent my 21st birthday in its show. All the girls took me to see on my 21st birthday to go see Charles Pierce. Next. The Hilton Hotel, if you go in there behind those, the sign, it was a police station. Yes. <laughs> there's where all the queens, the hustlers, if you were caught prostitution or selling drugs, that's where you would go. The Frolic Room. That was a beautiful place to go to because there was a lot of, we weren't called drag queens, we were called female impersonators. The drag queen didn't come out until the 1980s and the AIDS epidemic when uh, gay boys started dressing up like 
girls and making money for AIDS and started raising money for AIDS. That's how drag queens came about. But it was sissies, hotos, uh, all kinds of names that were thrown at us. But yeah. The Frolic Room was another female, uh, female impersonator place where if anybody remembers uh, uh, Pat Montclair, she Cherry, Cherry, Cherry used to work there. Cherry Vicky used to work there. Yeah. Well, let me do my show. <laughs> She's been my friend of 50 years. We've been, we had our ups and downs. And I will tell you a story about her later. <laughs> it was a place where you can just go and have fun and drink. And, you know, it was a mixed bar. It wasn't a, 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 a a gay bar only. It was uh, everybody, sailors, gays, lesbians, everything, just, just to have a good time and drink and, and see if you could make some money. Next. The Nickelodeon was the, after, after the frolic room closed, the Nickelode Nickelodeon came on and it was the same bar but a different name. 111 Mason is where all the queens used to live. It was a place where you left your door open because queens would go all over the place for makeup or hair and do whatever they had to do. The body shop was the one on the corner. It was a mixed bar. It was a transgender bar, a gay bar, lesbian bar, anything. It was a, just anybody could go have a good time. The trap. Anybody remembers the trap? It was strictly a gay bar. It was strictly for hustlers. Queens could not go in there. They would not allow queens to go in there because it would interrupt their money-making thing or something or other. The 181. Oh, God, it was a fabulous place. It was, uh, you go up the stairs with red carpet all the way up. And on the right hand side was a stage that used, used to be like a round, uh, half a, like a round plate. And to the left was the bar and, and it was uh, booths going up. There's where the, the female impersonators used to perform and there was a, a, um, a swing where they could swing all the way from, all the way to the, to the audience and back. <laughs> it was a fabulous, it was just, Vicky Marlene played there, uh, performed there. So did uh, uh, Aaron, so did uh, Michelle, so did Pat Montclair. And it was, you know, it was a place where you could just go and relax and just have fun. It wasn't a, well, it could be a trick bar too, so. Because a lot of people went in there, so. The 181 is where go -Go Boys, oh, go, go Boys were there too, so that's, <laughs> hey, men were there too. There was another gay bar called, uh, I don't know the name of it, but it was there and my friend Angel uh, uh, was a uh, female impersonator and she was the spitting image of Diana Ross. Wow. We always wonder what happened to her. We still wonder what happened to her. This little house right there, there was a, a shoeshine man an African-American man that had been there for over 50 years, and he saw everything, anything that you wanted to see. We wanted to uh, interview him for a film called Tenderloin, The Forgotten History, but he refused to give us an uh, interview. He would have been something to talk, something to interview because he had seen me since little young boy, to a hair fairy, to a drag queen, or, or and then up, and then I told him, I've seen you a lot of times, he says, but I never knew your name. Mm -hmm. And he retired a year after we did Tenderloin That Forgetting History. And they tore that, that little house down as fast as they could. See, the trouble is with us is that they, they, they destroy our history without even thinking that we've made history. 
I call this Market Mason and Turk, the gateway to the gay movement. Because this way is uh, Mason, on the left is Turk, and on the right is, Mason, is, is Market Street. So you have the whole entrance of the gay, all the gay bars over here, all the gay bars over here, and, and I'll tell you more about Market Street. That's another uh, form right there is the gateway. Next. This corner was Black Brothers on Market Street and was Hustler's Row. You, Queens could not go to the Hustler's Row until after 2 o'clock in the morning because then you would get the leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> If you guys know what I mean. <laughs> and right there was Hustlers Row. All through there was nothing but Hustlers. And it's, you knew that you don't go there until after 2 o'clock in the morning if you wanted somebody to have sex with. There was no money involved. It was free for the both of us. So it, the, they took the night off, and we took the night off too. The Old Crow was a gay bar. It was a hustler like the trap. It had a, a front entrance and a back entrance. So a lot of people that didn't want to be seen came to the back. If they left by themselves, they went to the front. If they left with a trick, they went to the back. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Landmark was a, a really good place, a beautiful place to be. You know, it's just a, a mixed bar. I think it was a piano bar, knowing the dog club was a, but it was a gay bar, mixed. Nobody to tell you you couldn't come in there or the way you were dressed or anything like that. So it was very fun to be there too. The dog club was across the street. I'm taking you on a tour of, of San Francisco. So uh, it, the dog club was a piano bar. Merrill's is another drugstore on Market Street where it was all the coins used to go there and buy their necessities of life. Zero, hair fairy, redded hair, reddish short hair, a little makeup and growing sweater, skin tight pants, and white tennis shoes. That is as close as we could get to feeling like a female because it was against the law to dress as a female or to have long hair. They put you in jail for impersonating a female. It was against the law to dress like a girl and wearing long hair would land you in jail. So queens would always cap, cap their hair. I missed her. Mm -hmm. Cap, cap their hair in, in the daytime. So you knew that they were feminine and, as, and they had beautiful long hair, you know. And it was their trademark to, to be who they were meant to be. But, Society just didn't want us, so. Chuckers, a place to be. <coughs> Chuckers was owned by Carlos and Chuck. So if Carlos named it Chuck hers because Chuck was hers. <laughs> you get it? And when you enter, it's, it, it, this is the before, this is, uh, this is sudden, I mean, but it, it had a sign on the door, enter at your own risk because this place could be rad, r raided at any time. That's how, uh, how difficult it was for us to grow as who we were meant to be. Chinese right next door to it. I mean, I mean, cheap food. <laughs> we didn't have much money, so hey, we, we went there a lot. <laughs> Rossi's, right on the corner of Turk and Taylor. And right underneath the Turk Street is now Vicky Marlene sign. But it's being turned down and it's now the, Wall, the Warfield Hotel now. Yeah, so a great history is where that was a trans, Transgender bar only. Uh, tricks came and 
did their thing or, or you would flag down somebody down because there were windows on each side. Mm -hmm. If you knew, if you recognized a trick, you would fly out to get that money. <laughs> Next. Original Joe's was the place where tricks used to take us for dinner. We had very few good dinners at that time. So we took advantage of a trick that would take us to a nice restaurant. The Deja Vu doesn't have a picture, but it used to be a mixed transgender bar. Queens, sissies, gay, lesbians, and it was a disco bar and stuff like that. So it was, it was a good place to be. Glide Memorial. It's, I didn't know very much about it because as Latinas, Asians, uh, blacks, and whites, a lot of us didn't care about being organized or anything like that. We, we were thrown away like trash, so we had to survive one way or the other. Selling our bodies was the first thing, and the second place was selling drugs. Next. Ram's Head was a, a, a gay bar that was really queens, hustlers, mixed drugs. I mean, anything you wanted, you got there. Now, as you see that, that picture was taken before the riot because the riot was, was uh, that, that uh, newsstand was burnt down and all the windows were broken, and it was the only place that any of us could come and organize, not organize, we, we weren't organized, we were just to meet somebody, to meet your friends, to see they had made it through the night, you know? And there used to be this intersect person, they used to always want to, you want to see what I got? You want to see what I got? And all the queens would go over there and to the restroom to see what he got. <laughs> it was silly, but it was our age. <laughs> Comtes Cafeteria came to be historic and lost our, the, the, the history was lost for 40 years because when the Jane Comtes Cafeteria riot happened, it wasn't in the media, it wasn't in on television, it was in the newspaper, it was not nowhere. Because some say that the mafia had all the gay bars control, paid off the cops. So when that riot happened, is that people, the girls were tired of being harassed, being thrown in jail for whatever. If the police didn't have a quota in one section, they would come into Compton's and, you know, take you for no reason. They would take you to jail for obstructing a sidewalk. Walking down the sidewalk, they would take you to jail just because they didn't like how you looked. And that was sad because we thought we came to a place where we were neat, we were, we liked it, we were accepted, but a lot of the policemen, a lot of the people didn't like us, but we, we, there was a whole bunch of us, so they couldn't throw us out one by one. So what happened is that the cops came and they all, always did this to us. They always wanted us out. Of course, we took advantage of that too, because we didn't have nowhere else to go. So we had coffee and stood there for two or three hours, maybe four. And the, it was a business and they had to make money, but we, it was the only place that we, at two o'clock in the morning, you could see the whole place full of queens and, and, and sissies and hustlers just having a good time and, and hoping that your friend had made it through the night. We were, we were beaten up, we were thrown in jail, we were killed, murdered, harassed for the slightest things that we could do. They take you to jail and undress you in front of the, 
the police and the, and the drunks. And that was embarrassing, embarrassing, embarrassing to us because as we thought we were girls, not knowing what transgender meant because we knew we were very feminine and we wanted to be who we were meant to be. And it's, it's when, it, when, you, when you go through all that and, and, and I'm living now at 70 years old and I was around 20 when it happened, it's just that it brings a lot of memories. Anyway, uh, yeah, the, 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 the Queens decided to rebel. It wasn't an organized thing. It was just happened. We were tired of being beat up, harassed, thrown in jail for nothing, for just being who we were meant to be. Uh, the cop came, harassed one of the girls. The girls went through coffee in one of them. And when the police, you have to understand, when, the, when you are cornered, you're going to fight back. And when they're cornered, they're going to have to fight back. So they asked for reinforcements, and that's how it went down. Uh, but two or three days later, it was like nothing had ever happened. Everybody went to being their normal self. Everybody went to back to Compton's and started doing the same thing. And, and it just w went that way. That's how uh, it closed in 1971. And then it turned into a, probably one of those uh, snooty, bar, snooty shops, sex toy shops or something like that. And then in 2000, June 2006, uh, the community led by Cecilia Chung and a lot of community members uh, decided to honor us after Susan Stryker came out with the documentary Screaming Queens, the Gene Compton's Cafeteria Riot. There was another uh, plaque by the Uptown Tenderloin Museum as Lost Landmarks, Compton's Cafeteria. Next. And that's what it looks like now. God, that was the best place for all of us because this was the only place in the whole world that we could come and and be who we were. I mean, it was dangerous because a lot of us were murdered, killed, and beat up and thrown in jail. But we had to stand up and believe that who we were meant to be, nobody could take that away from us. No matter how, what, how we were treated, no matter if we were killed or beat up or whatever, we had to be who we were meant to be because the same with you guys. If you didn't know who you were meant to be, you wouldn't be here today. So, some of the girls from the 1960s. <laughs> if you see the one on the left, that was Amanda. She was in the Compton's Cafeteria documentary. I don't know about the rest of the girls because a lot of the girls came from all over. You know, they came in and walked out. They came in and they came in and left, came in. It's just like a revolving door, you know. Some stay, like me and her. No, that's not me. No. I wish, but no. I could tell you a lie. <laughs> no. Next. Now, this is the hotels that we could be in. Uh, the, the first one, uh, further down is the Camelot, where they, they used to let uh, queens uh, live. The one in the brown, it was the uh, baths, the bulldog baths, where all the gay men used to do their thing and come out to drink and then go back and do their thing and come out. And, and then right next to where, where the blue and uh, orange thing is, is the blue and gold, was an African-American bar, gay bar. Very few white people or Mexicans went in there, okay? It's not that we were afraid, it's just that we had to respect 
it was their bar, you know? And that's, it was disco dancing and everything. Like some, some girls went in there, but they weren't thrown out, but it wasn't a place where we could go and have fun because we had to honor their space like they honor our space. Playland, does anyone remember Playland? Yeah. <laughs> Playland was at Ocean Beach. Can you believe this today? This is where all the kids, all of us came and we wanted to get away to be kids again. We had our little boyfriends, right? We had our little boyfriends. We had the girls come out and come out and we would terrorize them. <laughs> We were terrorizing. I said, what the fuck? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> it would terrorize us, you know. Um, it was fun. Next. Uh -huh. The blue and gold was the, that was the before before, and this is uh, the Kirkus Pass on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. And the blue and gold on the left-hand side, that's the way it was in the 1960s. Next. El Rosa Hotel. I first came in with five queens from San Jose. We, all we had was little, uh, I had a little wig, a blue dress, and a little shoes. And that's how I went out there and made my rent, my food, and whatever necessities I had to get to be, to, to survive. That's the sound of music downstairs, another gay bar. Then the Rams had moved from, from uh, uh, Taylor to around the corner to, uh, to Turk Street. This was my room. Now, this is 50 years later. <laughs> but it looks the same. <laughs> I, I think the only difference was is that that big old pole in the middle is for uh, earthquake safety. <laughs> but I have a feeling that's the same bedspread. <laughs> and I, it was on the third floor and I couldn't look out because I'm scared of heights, so. How, how did you get in to look at it? Uh, the Uptown, Uptown Tenderloin Museum yeah. was going to do, when they were going to open their uh, museum, they were going to uh, uh, duplicate my room there. And if you go to the next one, The Sound of Music. And that's the, the, it's still there. Yeah. It's still there. It's the historic sign because this is where we came, where we were allowed to live. We were allowed to express ourselves. And Amanda in the documentary was the clerk and she used to let us take tricks up for $5 each. <laughs> Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's an it's a it's a historical place where a lot of the queens came to live, like Amanda and all of us. You lived there, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, Didi lived there, so it was a place where we were accepted, where nobody could tell us nothing, and we could make extra money going upstairs with our tricks. So. The Roadrunner was a, another gay bar. Does anyone remember, remember the Black Rose? Oh, girl, you just wouldn't go in there. You had to have a gun or a knife to go in there. <laughs> because if the queen saw you, if the, one of the queens saw you see her man, she would pull up a knife and that's how vicious they and protective they were of their loved ones. <laughs> Kitty's restaurant was a, a restaurant where we used to come and eat and stuff like that, and where Miss Didi 
used to be a waitress. And what happened is tragic because uh, while she was working, one, one of the people uh, ran off not paying their bill and read her husband went after him and he was shot and killed right in front. That was, that was you know what year it was? Uh, that was in uh, uh, 1967 or 69. Yeah. So she lost her husband and she traveled all across to New York, to, New York to, to his burial. That's how she wanted her man. <laughs> and not only that, she was known as the best oh, cocksucker yeah. in the tenderloin. <laughs> I wasn't there, but I know because I used to live with her. No, she didn't do it to me. No, no. <laughs> no, we were girls. No, we didn't do each other. And Tina Kenny's was after hours, was after, you know, after the bars closed, you all go in there with, the, with, with your purse, with a liquor, or, and they sell Cokes and whatever, and you just topped your... It was right next door to Kitty's. Yeah, it was right next door to Kitty's. Yeah. So it was, uh, uh, it was fun, you know. You picked up tricks, you, you know, you picked up lovers, you picked up, if you didn't want to go home, you always had a place to go to to pick up somebody. The gangway. Sorry, is it going to close? No, it's still there. It's, I know, but it, it's... I, they, it's, it's indeterminate whether or not. I heard, I heard it's still going to stay open. They've been there since 1963 as the only gay bar that's still there in the tenderloin, other than Charlie's. The cockpit, a leather bar. We did not go in there. <laughs> we just walked in the door and peeked to see what was going on, and that was it. L later on, it came uh, to be, uh, um, what's the name of the uh, girl? Next, Mr. Leonas, and that they they did a lot of fundraisers for a lot of the Ducal Court and the Imperial Court were very involved in 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 raising money for whatever organization they could think of AIDS and if you were if if you're a member of the Ducal Court or the Imperial Court if you don't have enough money to bury to get buried they will bury you so that's a good organization. King Edwards was where I found uh, Roberta. She was a Latino female impersonator that used to sing with mariachis. And all the queens used to go there to the restaurants up to the, like, uh, Sutter Street. And they used to, they never thought that she was a, a, anything but a girl, but she used to uh, be very vocal with Latinas and, and uh, sing uh, Mexican songs and not even knowing that she was a transgender woman with, uh, with mariachis and she used to be fabulous. She did a lot of my birthdays at my house to, to come and, and perform at my house when, when she was alive. She died, she died about 10 years ago. The caboose in the 1960s it was half of, it was a, uh, the caboose, it's a train, right? Mm -hmm. It was where, it was a coffee shop where, where, where the bikers used to come mm -hmm. and they would park their, their bikes and all the queens used to just have a ball you know, <laughs> with all those bikers, have rides in them. And I even had a boyfriend that was in the Hells Angels. <laughs> Little old me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, don't always take a book by its cover, okay? <laughs> Look inside, okay? And Charlie's has been there for 25 years. Uh, it was the home of Vicki Marlene. It was home of the, the Hotbox Girls. The, uh, the, uh, there was another name for them before they 
became the hot box girl. Ricky Marlin used to, uh, used to, uh, no, no. No, uh, but anyway, whatever. Uh, it's, uh, she, I, she, was, she was HIV positive and I used to work at the, uh, uh, the food bank at uh, Project Open Hand. And she came in and, and this old girl, I haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah, I haven't seen you. What are you doing? Performing? Girl, are you still performing? She was, what, in her 60s or 70s, something like that? No, 60s when I met her, no. Uh, she was 76 when she passed away, 20 years is 55. And she says, oh, come on, do that, come on. And, uh, because I, when I was in Chicago, I used to perform as a female impersonator stripper at the Le Baton. And, uh, and she says, oh, come on to Aunt Charlie. She says, oh, no, girl, I don't perform no more. Oh, come on. And I started performing, and I would call the Mexican Spitfire. <laughs> We had a good time, and, and Aunt Charlie's is still there, still perform on Fridays, Saturdays, do fundraisers on Sundays, and every second and uh, fourth Wednesday, they do the Dream, Queen. the Dream Queens, which I am the one that named them. <laughs> but they, they, won't, they won't admit to that. <laughs> the Shed, it, does anyone remember The Shed? It was an after hours. This is, this, this is a story that I have to tell you because uh, uh, I, I, after I tried to transition in early 70s, I, came to, I wanted to have fun. So I came to the Alley Cat and it was a disco bar. This guy asked me to dance and I wouldn't dance with him. And I thought it was over, you know? I thought it was really over. So uh, I went to the shed after hours and he was there. And what happened is that he saw me and he grabbed me by the arm and put his other arm and took me to my car. And I drove somewhere where he raped me with a knife. I mean, I begged for my life because I knew if I didn't beg for my life that this would be the end of me. I would tell him, don't, please don't do it. I says, I'll give you my phone number and if you ever want to do something, I'll be there. I gave him the wrong phone number, of course. <laughs> but it was a time in my life and I couldn't go to the police because being transgender, it's just like you asked for it. So I went home to San Jose and for years I didn't talk about it, but it was the most scariest thing that I ever had in my life that nobody can feel it unless you go through it. And it, it changed me. It changed me to tell people that who I was at the beginning. And I just can't for, uh, forget it. Go next. That was the other part of the shed. It was advertised in, in the 60s. <coughs> Chuckers, after Chuckers closed on Turk Street, uh, it came to Mission Street and just lasted not very long. But it was a place where Chuck and Chuckers, Carlos and Chuck played, you know, owners of the bar, uh, where we met Angel and Tony and all the girls that just wanted to have a good time and it was a coffee, it was a coffee place, yeah, it was a coffee place. And it was a place where we could just relax and be ourselves and drink yeah, coffee. Near beer. Near beer? <laughs> near beer. Yeah. Who remembers near beer? Yeah. <laughs> Hot spot. It says 79 uh, uh, 6th Street, but it was a, another gay bar. And I met my first lover there, and his name was Joe, and uh, he, he, uh, I, I didn't come dressed up like a queen, I just came up like a sissy, you know, little, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> and, and we met, his name was Joe, and we met, and I was living at the 111 Mason, 
And that's why queens used to leave their door open and stuff like that. But at nighttime, I was a, a prostitute. And in the daytime, I was just a little gay, gay fairy in, in the tenderloin. So we got involved, and he took me to live in uh, North Beach at, a, at his uh, as this big old condo on the first floor. You could see the bay and everything else. Oh my God, I made it. <laughs> I'm in a touristy world now. Well, uh, his parents came and they talked him into moving back to San Diego and I moved with him and they were gonna put me through nursing school and all that stuff and he had been in Vietnam too. So one night we were laying down and all of a sudden, I hear this, somebody hitting me. He was hitting me with an iron. And he slashed my, my whole skull in the back and uh, I went to the hospital and he went to jail. And at that time, being homosexual was against the law and he would be thrown in jail. So the parents told me that not to file charges. They paid me $5,000. Okay, I'll go, bye. <laughs> and, but, uh, uh, it was just stuff that we have to go through as people, as who we are, you know? As being, uh, I, don't, I don't like LGBT. I'm old school. I come from the gay community because we were Latinos. We were African-American Asians and whites fighting for the same thing. And the LGBT puts us in boxes and I don't like that. And and, and another thing, I don't like the queer word. Queer word to me was a death sentence to us. It was a horrible, degrading word. A lot of times I was conferences in San Francisco and when they used that word, I walked out because it was so painful. But I got to live with it because there's so many of you guys nowadays. <laughs> These are our heroes from the 1960s. Uh, all the queens, all the names that, that, uh, that uh, and the new heroes of today, Gwen, Luis, Carol, Jasmine, Jazzy, Teresa, Storm, Sean Dorsey, Sean Navarago, Cecilia, Tia Dia, and many, many more. And Danny, I don't forget you. you. <laughs> Next. And this was all the gay bars that I have encountered, been in there, and know a little bit about the history. Mm. That, that it, it's, this was the tenderloin. It wasn't Polk Street, it wasn't Mission, it wasn't the Castro. Uh, I think all the people that were, that made it the Castro went through the tenderloin and got into the Castro, okay? Mm. This is me in 1969 in Chicago when I was a stripper. And this is the end of my tour that I call Turk, a market Turk and Mason, the gateway of the gay movement because we had the balls to be who we were meant to be. So now, so now all of you know our history. You have, to, uh, you have to know your history to be who you were meant to be on where you're going. Because without your history, like in the United States history, we wouldn't be who we are today if we didn't know our history. There's a lot of, a, a lot of the people, and, and I, I've said this to Don and to a whole bunch of people, the AIDS epidemic, lost a lot of our history because the gay men and the queens and the, 
and the trans women and the lesbians that did die of AIDS, they didn't have, no, we didn't know at that time that we could give our history to anybody. Or the families came, took what they wanted, and left the stuff behind, took what they didn't want, because we didn't have the gay marriage, we didn't have uh, all that stuff that we have today. Uh, and it's sad that, no, it's not sad. I am happy that I got all my friends here. Uh, I'm happy that I have, a, I have a family, a community, and uh, a man that has put his heart into, into uh, making sure that our history is never forgotten. Uh, Don has been, I worked with him with the Vicky Marlene exhibit, and he showed me what's good and what's not good in our history. But everything is good until it gets dissected to the important things of, of our history. If you have friends, seniors, make sure that they tell their story. Make sure that none of this is ever forgotten because the epidemic, the AIDS epidemic really killed a lot of our historians uh, and, I, and a lot of the community. And I hope that one of these days, uh, I don't, I want to strike the LGBT, that we're all a gay community, we're all together in the, in the same fight. And hopefully that all of you that are here and are loving and caring toward each other because we're not perfect. None of us are. And just, I always, I always, my, fam, my family right here is, is Marty and Donna and Luis and Danny and Jasmine and my special friend Sue and, and Didi, my friend of 50 years that we've gone through thick and thin. Come here, girl. Come here. Did you take? <laughs> we have. <laughs> she, she has. She has lived as she has lived as a woman and had no surgery. No surgery. <laughs> she's always been. She's always been looked as a woman, surgery or not. It's. It's not. The surgery that makes it. It's who you. Who you are. Yeah. Yeah. The way you want to be. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> we, we had our ups and downs, and we've been friends for a long time. We, oh, yes. we, we talk sometimes, and we yell we each other. We will talk for about a year, and then she'll call me, are you still alive? <laughs> 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 and all Donna, and Marty, and Reese, and Danny, and Jasmine, and Sue, and Don have always been, and my friend Amy from across the hall, she's always giving me encouragement, you go girl, you know, and all the people. Hopefully tonight you will go away and think. Be happy with who you are. Be happy with the people that you have around you. Cherish the people that are around you because they're here today and gone tomorrow. So it's very important that you guys do that. And to my, all my friends, uh, I hope the 50th anniversary of the Gene Compton Cafeteria, I wanted it at City Hall, but it takes decades <laughs> and we don't have it. But uh, go to, uh, the, go to uh, uh, FeliciaFlames.com buy a mug, buy a, a hoodie, buy a t-shirt that will make us, because on uh, August 28th, between one and five, we'll celebrate at Bove Decker Park. It's, 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 it's safer for us than to have it on the street. Yes. So uh, hope you get there, donate. We, uh, San Francisco Pride is our physical sponsor. So if you want to make a check, uh, make it to San Francisco Pride, and the note says uh, Compton's Cafeteria, and it'll come to us. Uh, we need your help. We really do, because it is the 50th anniversary. I, oh, and by the way, I have to tell you something. I got, 
What made me cry the most is, is this year at the White House, where President Obama added Comptons to Stonewall and Selma and some other one. I mean, I started crying when I was so bald because my president finally recognized Compton's cafeteria as one of the leading uh, riots in all of the United States. <laughs> and I know that Stonewall has been here for 40 years, and I don't want you to forget that either because Majors and Sylvia and other girls made it happen, you know. It's just, it was, I, 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 I don't say that only the, the queens and the drag queens and the queens and the sissies did it because there were hustlers that were gay that were in that same era. We were all together. We did it all together. Nobody had one uh, better than other, and that's what we need to uh, close that it was all of us at Stonewall, we were all at Compton's Cafeteria, we were all at, when we get the great Gay Pride Parade, we're all there together. So instead of hating, love each other, take care of each other, because there's only one community, the gay community. Yes. Thank you. Oh, by the way, when President Obama wrote me an email and thanked me for my service. I'm nothing to a star. We have time for a few questions, so if, uh, if people want to ask questions, anybody? Is everyone here in the front? I don't know how long the cord goes. If you're not in the front, you're not going to be on the mic. <laughs> so whatever happened to Carlos Lara from the Trumpers? I don't know. See, the trouble with our community at that time, people went and left. The same thing the other day, somebody told me, where's Francine? Remember Francine? She looked like Popeye in drag. <laughs> she was a bar owner here in the city, a gay bar, bar owner here in the city, uh, Francine, and she used, to, she, used to, she used to pay for a lot of the queen's surgeries. But she was helpful, very helpful. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I, a lot of the people walk in and we lose it. We always think of Angel. We always think of the girls that were here, and we don't like Loopy and uh, Loopy and what, what was her sister's name? Loopy and they were trans. No, they were queens from L.A. that came to San Francisco, and uh, there was a lot of queens from uh, uh, New York, a lot of queens from Texas, a lot of queens from San Jose, L.A. I mean, they were from all over because it was word of mouth that it went through that where uh, Compton's uh, uh, or the Tenderloin was so and came to be the gay mecca of San Francisco in the 1960s. Mm. Word of mouth, mm. that was it, and, and the gay bars too. Do we have any other questions out here? Uh, yeah, back here. Um, uh, Mr. Lara was in the Do you really want me to think about it in 50 years later, girl? Yeah, I was going to ask you about Vietnam, but um, I'm curious how that came about. So the question was, so the question was, what um, for those of you behind, um, uh, what can you actually detail some of what actually went down that night uh, at Compton's, and then also a question about Vietnam? No. <laughs> I wish I could, but it, it's just, I mean, we were not, we, we didn't think of it as being a historical thing. It's just like being harassed and being beat up by a trick, you know. They came and they did their things and they left. It wasn't a, a, 
uh, think, oh, we're going to organize and do all this stuff, you know? No, it was a, a, the spare of the moment that it happened, that the cops came and harassed us and wanted to make their quota, or they just wanted to give us a bad time where uh, on a weekend they pick us up on Friday, on a three-day weekend holiday where we could make our money, pick us up on Friday, throw us in jail, till Tuesday we would come out and the charges would be dropped. Vietnam, did you say? Oh my. Huh? Well, they said it because I wanted, after being a, 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 a queen and I didn't want to be this way anymore, I didn't want to be gay, I didn't want to be a sissy, I wanted to make my mother proud, you know, and all that stuff. I wanted to be the butch man that I never was. <laughs> uh, I decided to join the military because my best friend, I had just broken up with my lover, and my best friend, was going with him and I just couldn't see them together. So I told my mother either, you help me join the military or I'm gonna leave. I, I went to the military, I went through all this manly stuff. I should have gone through, a, I should have won an Academy Award for playing a man during a, being a woman, okay? <laughs> and then I was in Vietnam and I was unloading cargo way down on a ship somewhere. And I woke, I, I came up and says, oh no sister, if the military can't make me a man, nothing will. <laughs> I told my, my priest and I told my captain that I was gay and they took me out of there so fast. Other than first, it was during time of war. So I had to be interviewed by the CIA and the FBI. When am I going to tell them? I put my legs up and I did this. And, <laughs> and they gave me an undesirable discharge in 1966 and then in early 1974 when I, they gave me my honorable discharge, uh, I went through a court and stuff like that and they reversed it from an undesirable discharge to an honorable discharge. And I had my records changed in the 1970s and from San Angelo, Texas. My birth certificate, my baptism, everything, all the military records were changed. And it was easy for me, I don't know why, but for a lot of the girls, it isn't easy, so yeah. I came back and I started, I, I wanted to make, I, uh, the reason that I, mo I, I volunteered for Vietnam because I wanted my, I, I hoped that I would get killed. And that way I would become a hero to my family. And, but this girl said, oh no sister, I'm getting the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other questions? Can we have some here? Yeah. yeah I, I, Okay, when I was a queen in the Tenderloin, I was, uh, we knew about Roxanne. And we knew about Roxanne because she was known as a transsexual, uh, uh, a sex change, we call them sex changes, uh, uh, in the 60s. And she worked on Broadway as a stripper. And that's the only connection that I got with, uh, with, with uh, being a, a sex change. We didn't know about Transgender, I mean, transgender was before surgery, transsexual was after surgery in our time. But when I saw the Christine Jorgensen movie in, in Chicago, there's where a light bulb went out. Oh my God, that's who I am. How the fuck am I gonna get there? <laughs> you know, being poor, being uh, Latina and having no education, how the hell am I gonna get there? And in 1971, I transitioned from Felipe to Elena Nicole Montes because I didn't want my fam the news to get a hold of, my na of what I'm doing and embarrass my family. And I got to meet Christine Jorgensen in person. And 
she, the, the way they portray her like a big football player, she was a very petite, like Miss Jasmine over here. Very petite woman, very pretty, lovely woman that, that she did a, a, a lecture at the, uh, San Jose State. Mm. And uh, drag queens wasn't used, trans wasn't used, transgender, wasn't used either. We were just queens, sissies, jotos, and that was it until we just started to get educated. You know what I mean? Did, did Roxanne, uh, was she billed as a sex change stripper? No. Or was she a, a woman? No, she was billed as a woman. Yeah, yeah. She came to several of my birthday parties at, at where I live now uh, because she, she gave us a lot of hope. Yeah. Just by putting a little light bulb, light bulb in your head that and then when I saw Christine Jorgensen movie, that even went through a bigger light bulb, where, oh my, I could, I could, I could do that. But you know something, you have to understand, the girls that go through surgery know what they want. Because I don't think any of you would want your penis cut and you weren't going the right way, you know? <laughs> this is a very difficult surgery and you have to be certain that you are who you are to have this surgery because you don't, you don't want to regret that you had this surgery. Mm -hmm. And I have never regretted. I woke up in the morning and said, oh my God, thank God I've lived one more day. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be 70 years and how many days? Three or four? <laughs> Keep going. More questions? Yes. Well, this isn't a question, but I remember, I'm older than I, I like to see it, but, uh, you know, Greg, Maybe in your circle, but not in mine. <laughs> I, no, no, I, I understand. I understand. I'm just kidding. You know, it's just that we were little kids. We were young kids. I mean, our, our, we were just uh, young kids that, you know, something, we were out there. We, we, we didn't know we were going to survive. We didn't know if, if anything is going to happen to us, but a lot of us didn't make it, and a lot of us did. And what was the good part of it is that there, there's a lot of seniors out there that in the gay community that need to tell their story. And it's imperative that we find them and to let them know where if they pass away that they make sure in their will that it's, it is given to the GLBT Historical Society Museum. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, Drag queens didn't come out until the 80s when the AIDS epidemic came out, was more famous. Because, and then I became a transsexual drag queen. I, I think we have time for like one or two more questions, yeah. Lisa, thank you again so much for being here. I'm really inspired uh, to hear your stories. And your, your, your courage is just amazing to me. And especially what, what you've done with that later in life. Um, and what I'm thinking about is that, especially in our community, we begin to like think that things are a lot better now, and, mm -hmm. and, and they are in a lot of ways, of course, you know, but um, with the, you know, I think when you're talking about yourself as a young, a young girl in the Tenderloin, it's very, the feeling must be very similar to being a young trans person in many parts of the country, you know, where they feel very alone and they don't understand what, who they are, what's happening to them. And uh, I'm very concerned that, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm ashamed to even bring it up that in this country that we have to deal with things like the, the bathroom, the bathroom laws, you know, the Supreme Court just ruled yesterday yeah. that uh, this young transgender boy, 17, has to go to his senior year in school in Virginia, going to the bathroom for the gender of his birth rather than the gender of his identity. And I think it's I, I don't know, I, I guess my question is, uh, 
what do you think, what, do you, what is your response to that, to the difference in, in, in are we doing enough? How can we, how can we help the young people that are feeling isolated and don't understand, you know, that the way that the federal government is down on them and saying that it's not okay to be who they, who they are. Um, I mean, there's legal remedies, but um, how, can, how can we better reach people? So the question, the question basically was, for a lot of trans, especially young people today around the country, are things actually that much better for them than it was uh, for Felicia and others in the 1960s? Um, and what does Felicia think we can be doing uh, for those trans, uh, those trans youth today? Thank you, John. That's too political for me. <laughs> 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 no, uh, I think, you know something, I mean, we should, uh, the youth of today have a lot of freedom that we did not have at that time. And, and you have to understand, a lot of us don't look like natural women when we begin. So it takes a transition of a lot of female hormones or male hormones to go either way. So it's, you know, if you're detected, you know, it could be harder for a young trans woman to, to go to the bathroom. But I think it should be like, I'm, I'm not that into that solution of, of trying to remedy anything with trans people right now because I'm only living from day to day and hopefully I can live one more day, mm. you know? So uh, uh, I know a lot of my friends are very more political than I am. In the 60s, it was hard for us to go to the, to the uh, ladies' room. Sure. We had to use the men's room, you sure. know. We had to, I could be in beautiful drag and everything and all that, and, and people were in the, in the, in the woman's, uh, and a woman would go and tell the police, oh, you go to jail. Yeah. You go to jail, but they, I don't know about them now. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, we used to go to jail, just you know, try to go into the, the bathroom. Room. Right. Yeah. Felicia, tell them you don't vote for Trump because the free public can go in. You're all going in. Well, <laughs> suffice it to say that for many reasons, if anyone here is voting for Trump, please quietly leave. <laughs> 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 we'll no. we welcome everyone at this museum, but uh, Lisa, I just, I just want to say that you are doing your part, so thank you very much. There's, there's one more right here. Luis. We've, we've got one more question over, right, over here. here. Oh, okay, over here. We've got two more questions then. Um, this isn't really a question, but I just want to say before, um, before we end that Felicia is also available to speak at colleges and universities, yep. other types of settings, and um, that information can be found on her website, FeliciaFlames.com, for a speaker's fee, yep. not for free. Right. <laughs> and um, she especially is fantastic at speaking about being a long-term survivor of HIV and AIDS, uh -huh. talking about the early days of HIV and AIDS, talking more about some of our trans history and also some of our current work. So folks with um, university connections, um, she also will travel for um, travel fees and larger speaking fees, mm -hmm. uh, but she can be booked for all that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I want to add to that. I want to add to that because um, I had Felicia kick off uh, this uh, queer studies lecture series that we do at Sonoma State University. It's a one unit class and it's, um, it's for general education requirements. So like people take it that have no, they just want the credit. They don't necessarily even care about LGBT stuff at all. Um, and she kicked off the series and um, at the end of the series, there were 12 speakers across the semester. Um, every single person I think uh, wrote that you were one of the highlights for them. And they also mentioned that you uh, called out your friend as the best cock sucker in the Tenderloin. <laughs> but it was a fantastic, really, if anybody here has university connections, um, bring Felicia to talk, for sure, for sure. She's amazing. Um, one last one. One last question. Oh, I just wanted to know what you think would be, what's the best way that we can be supporting uh, trans and LGBT seniors today, now? First of all, we have to unite. Mm -hmm. We have to all unite. Uh, the whites, the black, the Africans, and the Asians have to unite. No matter if you're, if you're in the gay community, the LGBT community, Q, Q, Q community, we have to, we have to unite. 
because it's important because we could be very powerful in government if we all unite and fight for the same cause that we did in 1966, that we were all together, we were all colors, we were all doing the right thing to, to stand up to be who we were meant to be. And thank you so much. It's overwhelming to see all you people. You got educated, you get an A. Yeah. All right, thanks everybody for coming and go onto our website to see everything else that's happening in the series. We've got a lot of really great stuff for celebrating Hong